So, we're going to talk about Ebola. And working in an Ebola treatment unit was by far and away the most difficult and hardest thing that I've ever done in my life, both physically and uh, mentally. I dealt with staggering levels of suffering, of pain, of confusion, and death. I also saw incredible beauty and courage and dignity and dedication and love. And I saw that from both patients and staff and the community that we were in. Um, on August 8th, the World Health Organization declared a world crisis, a global emergency around Ebola. And it was at that moment that my wife and I decided that I should go. My wife, Julie, and we looked at each other and said, basically, well, if not me, who? And um, we were moved by the level of human suffering that we were seeing and hearing about. We were moved by the very real sense of possibility of a global health crisis. And it was the right thing to do. So we made the decision, August 8th, to prepare for me to go to Sierra Leone. At that very same moment, Sarah Page, a medical geographer working with the Global Health Institute, who worked in Africa, made the decision to use her skills to start the Ebola Survivor Project, or Ebola Survivor Corps. And that was to help survivors of Ebola, who now had an immunity to the disease, to become healthcare community organizers. That was the vision. She set out on that at almost the exact same moment that I set out on my vision of going to Sierra Leone. And one of the first things that I want to share with you is that outbreaks will always happen. There's nothing that we can do to prevent outbreaks of multiple diseases throughout the world. But we can prevent epidemics. Epidemics do not have to happen. The Ebola epidemic was driven primarily by weak healthcare structures and systems, both locally and globally. And it was driven by deep poverty, by lack of sanitation, by lack of access to clean water, uh, poor nutrition, no education, no access to health care. It is poverty that drives epidemics. And this is not just true of Ebola. It, it, it's true of typhoid and cholera and TB and AIDS and malaria. And we'll come back to why that is particularly important, I think, when we're wrapping up uh, tonight's program. In November of 2014, I went to Sierra Leone. And at that time, um, I went to Port Loco, which was the epicenter of the epidemic. There were 1,300 new cases of Ebola a week at that particular moment. And in Port Loco, there was a crisis. The uh, government hospital collapsed along with the healthcare infrastructure in Guinea and Liberia and Sierra Leone. Well, what happened in Port Local was similar. 20 staff, doctors and nurses died in a couple weeks of Ebola, and the hospital simply shut down. And there were hundreds, literally hundreds of people dying in the street. And the few people in the hospital were simply there uh, being housed. Nobody was being treated, and there was a crisis. The, uh, the Ministry of Health put out a call that we need to have an ETU. And you both should be unit in Partners in Health step forward and said that we will uh, meet with the Ministry of Health and we will open a center at Moforki, which was a trade school that the Red Cross had started 12 years earlier than that. And so we opened Moforki, a 108-bed unit in November, very early November of that year. And when I got there, we had a 10% survival rate. And um, what kills Ebola patients is massive, massive loss of body fluid diarrhea and vomiting, and also fever in these very, very, very hot, hot treatment units. Um, it's often said that there's no treatment for Ebola or hemorrhagic diseases, and that's not true. Um, what's needed is very, very strong, focused, supportive care. Uh, the replacement of fluids and electrolytes, um, and the secondary treatment, of, or the treatment of secondary infections that say come from the gut or malaria for example. So we made a decision. We said we're going to prophylactically treat with antibiotics. We're going to prophylactically treat everybody from malaria. We are going to systematically replace electrolytes, particularly potassium, and we're going to start IVs. And IVs, it sounds simple, but it was actually a very daunting thing. It was dangerous. It was not easy, but we did it. And we successfully started IVs. And um, we were able to turn this around so that when I left, we had uh, a 40% uh, survival rate. 
And um, I guess what I want to say, it's a picture just outside the ETU Mofforki. And we had a lot of death. I mean, there was just no question that, that death was omnipresent, death was painful. There were more things that we didn't have than we did have. We never had narcotics, we never had pain medicine. People died often in really excruciatingly difficult ways. But we also had survivors. And when I left, oops, I got the pressing the wrong button. There we go. Thank you, Andrew. He's going to help me. But so these are survivors. And when I left, we had 130 survivors. Um, this is a survivor ceremony. She's getting a certificate that says that she no longer has Ebola, which was really important. Now, these people are going home with these things because everything they have has been burned. Every single thing they have has been burned. So, sending them home with some mattress, maybe some rice, some oil, and helping them uh, somehow integrate back into their lives was really critical and not easy. There was a lot of fear. There were, these people were ostracized. We went through a lot of getting the paramount chiefs, getting the imam, getting the priests, getting people to sort of help us getting them back into their villages. Plus, people often had um, different medical sequelae. They had neurological problems. They had no malaria. And we were in the process then of reopening government hospitals so that they could get treatment. These are survivors. This is the survivor tree. This is the image that I want you to remember. Um, we had a ceremony, and uh, there's 130 ribbons there, each one representing a survivor. And the survivor would come, and they'd put the ribbon out there. And that, that tree, that tree is something that we all, every one of us who work there, I think um, it gave us a great sense of hope and purpose. Um, so these survivors, they needed a lot of support, but they also, they had a lot to offer. And Partners in Health had a program to work with survivors, uh, engaging them to help with community outreach and with children. Um, when I came back to the States, I really wanted to continue and deepen my relationship with survivors. And that was just an idea that I was rummaging around in my head with when I was in quarantine. I did three weeks of quarantine, and I said, somewhere, somebody's doing work with survivors, and I'm going to find them. I didn't know that they were right here in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> that Sarah Page and this amazing group of people had started the Ebola Survivor Corps, and here they were doing this just beautiful work with survivors. And what the Ebola Survivor Corps has is a goal of elevating the social status of Ebola survivors, remembering that they have been ostracized, and sometimes in really severe ways, while simultaneously improving the community health, stopping the transmission of Ebola, and building public health resilience in Sierra Leone. We have, at this very time, hired and trained Ebola survivors in Konadungu, a very poor and underserved area of Sierra Leone. They're being trained in infection prevention and control, receiving training in social mobilization, community organizing, and public health. Uh, survivor health advocates serve as first responders uh, in suspected Ebola cases and for other diseases. It's a model that we know can be used in things beyond just Ebola, but can be transferred into various other health situations in various other areas. Um, they provide infection prevention and control training to at-risk persons in the community, particularly traditional birth attendants and traditional healers. And this is really important to, to see that these are people from the community who will be able to approach people with a, a level of respect and sort of, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, it, it is a common thought that somebody is sick because they've been cursed. So um, instead of saying, well, no, they're not cursed, we don't believe that they're cursed, you say, well, yeah, it's very possible that they're cursed, but that doesn't mean that germ theory isn't important. They're cursed, but we still got to wash our hands. We still have to do prevention of infection and working with birth attendants so that we're respectful of their basic cultural values and understandings, but still working with, again, infection control and prevention. This is really critical. Um, they are a resource to the Ministry of Health for public health campaigns, recently doing a campaign around measles, an example of how this is used in other ways. 
uh, provided basic health education and information. <coughs> there's a lot that we do not know about the medical sequelae of Ebola. There's a lot that we're finding out. And the Ebola Survivor Corps is committed to ensure ongoing psychosocial and medical support for all <coughs> survivors. Now, Lena, what I want to tell you is that the PIH and the Ebola Survivor Corps have some amazing, incredible, inspiring people. People that changed my life, enriched my life. And um, they all have one thing in common and that they're committed to and work towards and understanding that healthcare is a right for all people and they have worked towards with direct health care to mobilize people for social justice in a global sense. Building social justice globally. Again, using health care. Um, and Lena Moses is one of these people. Um, she's an epidemiologist, and as such, she was studying uh, loss of fever in Sierra Leone when the Ebola outbreak um, happened. And many people fled. It was really scary. It was very intimidating, and she didn't. She stayed, um, and she played a very critical role in the epidemic response. And we are so proud and fortunate to have her as part of the Ebola Survivor Corps team, and we're just thrilled that she's here in Madison, Wisconsin to share her experience in Sierra Leone. Anyway, so I'm up to 16,000 deaths. 
You can see by the range of this that really the numbers are kind of BS. You don't really know. Uh, what we do know is that Lhasa is found in West Africa. Even though the rodent that's, that transmits Lhasa is spread throughout the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. So we're starting to tease this out now. But we've got case fatality rates of about as high um, or comparable to what we were seeing in the Ebola outbreak. Um, so it's a severe disease. The other interesting thing about this disease is that it has symptoms, a clinical picture that's very similar to Ebola, but it also has isolation procedures that are very similar. And as a result, we have this Tulane University Lhasa Fever Program in Panama that um, we work hand in hand with the Ministry of Health to look at loss of fever, um, diagnostics, disease burden, community outreach, and disease ecology, which is, I like to track rats. That's what I do. So um, we have Emily, Emily, you joined us, I don't know, a couple months after this picture was taken here. Um, but uh, we have as our partners um, a physician. Um, we have nine nurses that, that work with us cleaners, uh, drivers. Um, I work most closely with the community outreach and the zoology teams. Um, but this is it. Here's our laboratory up here on the upper right. This is the clinical team here, cleaners and nurses. And these are my guys, my, my ecology guys, my, um, my outreach guys. This is so, so what we had there in Kenma was, was somewhat unique. We had an isolation ward that could handle um, diseases like viral hemorrhagic fevers, uh, which was unique to the area and, and actually was unique to nearly the entire world. So what happened in March of um, March 22nd to 2014 is that I, I read ProMed, I don't follow ProMed at all. And if you're interested in disease emergence, um, and outbreaks and such. I, I really recommend you get on the list, sir. But I follow it, I was in Sierra Leone following it, and we saw a request for information about something that looked like suspected Ebola, and then sure enough, on the 22nd of March, um, we get a notice that basically um, they've confirmed Ebola in Guinea. So Guinea, where, where it actually occurred, is in this red star right here. Um, a small, tiny village in Miliandu. Um, and then you started to get a lot of circulation nearby in Gekadu and the Senta. So when, when Ebola was confirmed in, in March of that year, um, we were over here, this is where Tulane's um, lab works, um, our operations are. The Ministry of Health in Sierra Leone said, you know, can you help us out? Can you, if we have some Ebola cases, can you, can you handle it? Um, and we thought we were ready because we've seen Ebola <coughs> outbreaks before, historically, right? Uh, the biggest outbreak before had been around 400, a little just shy of 500 people. So we thought, well, maybe we'll get a few cases come trickling over from Guinea, and I think we can handle a few, a handful. So March 22nd, 23rd, we had our first case investigation, where we heard of a rumor of someone coming across the border from um, who actually died in Guinea, his body was transported back to Sierra Leone, and then his son fell ill and also died. So we followed this up, um, and it's likely, very, very likely that this person, that both of these people had Ebola, but we came two weeks too late. But what we did do is we did um, monitoring of every single person in the village, because every single person in the village had contact with one of these two people um, for one more week, and no one else got sick. We tried to stay vigilant, responding to anything that we thought was a rumor of um, Ebola. But sure enough, um, the cases in Guinea started going down. There was a little flare-up in Liberia that went away. We actually thought that Ebola was was over. So I'd been in Sierra Leone for a while. I missed my kids. Decided to go home. Um, arrived back in New Orleans on the 23rd of May, and I got an email, or a WhatsApp message, that's how we do it in Sierra Leone, um, on May 25th that we had our first cases of Ebola in Panama, and there were actually three cases. So, 
What we did was we converted our loss award to an Ebola, Ebola virus disease award. Ebola award. Um, I got back on June 3rd, and we had three cases in there. Three women who had come from this area of Sierra Leone called Kevin. By June 5th, I was just looking at some emails. I sent an email to my colleague who, I also, who works in Panama as well. We're reaching our limits. Ward is full of Ebola cases. We're starting to put people on the floor. Uh, by June 7th, um, we had 33 positive cases. Now, normally in the peak of the fever season, we get a maximum of maybe five. So that is, five is a heavy load for us. 33 is something that we never, ever dealt with before. It was, it was, we were putting patients on the floors. We were putting them in corridors, we were having them share beds. Um, so, this is the main area of activity. This is where the Ebola cases were coming from, in orange here, this orange circle. And they were being transported over here to Canada. Okay, so June 18th, um, the first member of our team, a driver, uh, died of Ebola, which was a really big shock for us. Um, and then between June 17th and the 23rd, three um, people from WHO came and actually changed a lot of the operations. Before, it had been two vehicles um, trying to respond to all these suspected and confirmed cases. Vehicles, these two vehicles and three outreach members um, going out into the villages, getting attacked. Um, all of our windshields had been destroyed. Um, and so we had three WHO staff that had extensive experience with Ebola came and um, they really mobilized us to put us in order. What they lacked, though, was someone who could do logistics. And they lacked money and resources. Okay. By June 30th, we had 200, over 200 confirmed positive cases, which is, which for most um, Ebola outbreaks, this is far beyond most of the Ebola outbreaks that have been documented already, so in the first month. Um, and then by July 31st, remember all the people that we had on staff? Uh, unfortunately, and it was almost a time of the nurses, 11 member of, members of our team had gotten contracted Ebola um, and only four survived. So, this is what um, the hospital looked like in September of 2014. Um, it's completely transformed. Uh, all of these temporary structures were put up to isolate people and, and corral them into places where they were safe or unsafe and to protect workers. Um, no one could wear rubber boots. I didn't really like that. I like sandals. It's hot. Um, we had to wash hands. We weren't allowed to hug each other. I'm a hugger. So, <laughs> so there, 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 was, there was a lot of transition by September. Um, so, Canada Government Hospital, if you look in the records, especially in the New York Times, um, it, it's kind of a infamous for the evil outbreak in terms of the horror that happened there. Um, but I actually think that there's a lot to be examined in terms of the Ebola response in Panama. First of all, um, Panama was one of the first of the districts to, um, to experience Ebola. And as a result, everything was very, very local. Um, the entire response was local. Um, so we had a locally-led um, response team um, headed up by the district medical officer, um, Juan Vani. And this guy is a tyrant. He would not put up with anything, no misbehavior. He had really long meetings. But he <laughs> took control of everything. And that's what we needed at the time. And what we did is we basically, we basically pooled all of our resources, district council, local NGOs, um, anything that we could, um, in order to mount some kind of response. Um, and then um, the other thing that he did was made sure that the surveillance team 
The surveillance team is one, they identify cases, they bring them in for isolation, they identify contacts and they monitor them. The surveillance team is the cornerstone of operations in Sierra Leone, or in the Kenema district. So, in, in fact, this is one of the few districts that I ever saw in Kenema where it is very much a locally led and orchestrated um, <coughs> response. And it continues to be vigilant um, and has expanded not just for Ebola but into Lhasa and other diseases. Um, and, and teams are still meeting today. So I'm from New Orleans, and I think most people here understand that there was a, a small hurricane that happened yeah. a few years ago, a um, decade ago. So I'm actually really comfortable in the aftermath of Ebola kind of processing this this way very comfortable and know very well about natural disasters that fold into man-made disasters, okay? And as I'm kind of processing what happened in Sierra Leone with Ebola, I'm really starting to understand, I think, um, how epidemics really are, as Mark said, results of very human-driven factors, okay? So the usual question that I get from the Ebola outbreak here is, what's different about this epidemic? Why was it so big, right? So here's the history. I just grabbed a handful of Ebola outbreaks that happened. Look at the numbers, right? So we're talking about, this is the second largest here in Uganda, in Gulu. The second largest Ebola outbreak was a total of 425 cases. What's the Mano River Union? The Mano River Union is, so the Mano River is a river that flows um, between Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. And so it's easier than saying Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. So, um, so those, those are the Mano River Union countries. Sometimes people may include Cote d'Ivoire in there too. Thanks for the question. Anyone else have a question? <laughs> so the magnitude of this is immense, right? Um, and a lot of things, Mark mentioned a few, a lot of the reasons why we speculate um, that this was so bad, a lot of this had to do with, this is the difference, right? Huge population densities in West Africa. The population density in West Africa is the highest population density in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we've got really a highly mobile population. Why? because we've got sweet roads in Sierra Leone, okay? One of the biggest things, how many of you have heard about the Civil War in Sierra Leone? It was amazingly brutal, we liked to, they liked to cut off arms, right? Blood diamonds, all that kind of stuff. It devastated the economy, the health infrastructure, everything in Sierra Leone. And the way that a lot of the development that happened afterwards focused on was getting the economic um, development up and running. And that translated into building really nice roads. That you could move things like iron ore and biofuels and um, what else? Uh, palm trees, palm oil. All these things that we like to take out of Africa. We can move them out much faster. So this is what we're doing in Sierra Leone. Really good roads mean that people with Ebola can travel very quickly as well. And that's one of the things that I think really was a big, big factor. When you look at the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it is a country that is not traveled by roads. We travel by river or plane. So moving people <coughs> around who have Ebola are very, is very, very difficult. So I think that's one of the factors. But I think what's more interesting, here, what do these epidemics, these outbreaks of Ebola have in common. And if you can see here, we've got Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Uganda, in South Sudan, and then you've got this cluster of this recent epidemic. Anyone want to hazard a guess what these countries have in common? Well, you're going to cheat, right? Oh. <laughs> i got to stop reading the answers. <laughs> okay, so this is the thing. All of these countries have huge amounts of civil unrest, conflict. Very brutal, brutal conflict, okay? They have very fragile governments. Um, 
Um, and a lot of this um, manifests in, in a big time lag between the time that Ebola pops up and the time we actually identify it. In the case, in this particular case in West Africa, having <coughs> cases, our first case in December, it didn't get identified until March. So this is plenty of time for the virus to kind of fester in the population. Okay, so we have poor health indicators, right? Really horrible maternal mortality, <coughs> infant mortality, under five mortality, life expectancies in these countries. And then when you see under this framework um, what happens in an Ebola outbreak and the commonalities between all of this, you also get really bad messaging early on, really bad community messaging. In, in West Africa, they were really encouraging people not to eat bush meat. Okay? We don't even know if bush meat was the source of this outbreak. We don't know if someone ate. Um, we like to call it game in the US, right? We like to call it bushmeat when it's in Africa. We would like to go hunt things and shoot them here too. And when we eat them here, it's, it's game. So they were talking about not eating bushmeat. We're not sure if that had anything to do with the first case. We definitely know it had nothing to do with all the 28,000 cases that followed. It's a bad message. Why? Because people are not going to think that I didn't have eat any bush meat, so it, I couldn't, this fever and diarrhea couldn't possibly be related to Ebola. Next, they also said that there's no treatment and that 90% um, of people die. So given that information, why would you leave your family and go into a health center? Makes no sense whatsoever. So the messaging was really, really bad. Inappropriate. They tried. Um, there's also a lot of mistrust and resistance to the outbreak response. And this is built on a mistrust of the health system already that is completely incapacitated. And it's, it's not just the Ebola treatment units that people think you go to to die. It's the hospitals, too, in Sierra Leone. You go to the hospital, it's your last resort. And a lot of people think they're going to go there to die. So, um, Ebola also causes a complete collapse of the health system because a lot of healthcare workers are getting sick. And all the other healthcare workers are rationally thinking that, well, I'm kind of scared. I don't have gloves or running water in my health clinic. I think I'm going to leave. So guess what doesn't get happen? Guess what doesn't happen? Maternal care, pre prenatal care, antenatal care, malaria treatment, measles vaccinations. All these things don't happen. It really does yield a complete collapse in the health system. And then you have a valuable loss of healthcare workers. In Sierra Leone, we had less than 150 um, doctors and before the outbreak, and 11 of them are dead now. So 10% of the physician workforce in Sierra Leone is gone. So, um, my friend, Dan Gosh, he's this big Ebola guy. He likes to liken Ebola outbreaks to a canary in a coal mine. What, when you see Ebola happen, it's a good indication that the healthcare system is broken completely when you're seeing it pop up. And if you look at this, in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, the countries that received, that had the most cases during this epidemic, um, you can look at the government per capita health uh, expenditures on health. Compare that to the U.S. Okay. Now, life expectancy at birth. These are health indicators that that demonstrate that the healthcare system there is really not functioning, nor is the public health system. Okay. It's really important to keep in mind that in this beautiful, beautiful country, there's a lot of really good things that happen. But Sierra Leone, it's also a, a very epidemic prone country. It's not just Ebola that we're talking about. Um, right before I came to Sierra Leone for the first time, they had a yellow fever outbreak. <coughs> um, 2012, there was chicken guinea outbreak, and then there was cholera. There were more cases of cholera in Sierra Leone than there were in Ebola. Does anyone know that? Anyone heard about it? Cholera and Ebola, in terms of the way it kills, not too different. 
So what we're dealing with here is a whole system that's going to repeatedly have epidemics unless we do something. Okay? So how do we prevent diseases from emerging? This is what I study. This is my area of esoteric research. Um, so, and then also, how do we keep ourselves safe? And this harkens back to the idea of global health security. Um, spillover happens, okay? Pathogens cross from animals to humans all the time. Yeah? I think we get really, really nervous about this. Uh, because we know that Ebola, and MASA, and a lot of other scary diseases um, are transmitted in this way and introduced into the human population. Um, it's a big step, though, to go from this to this to this. Okay? So, we've really made this a fancy, fancy topic. We are virus hunters, right? We have Anderson Cooper one hour specials on us. We write awesome books and star in awesome movies because we are hunting viruses. We are at the forefront of what is happening at the animal human interface. Um, so that's what we do. But it's not that simple. Okay? Biologically, this First step has to happen, level one. You have to be exposed. So an animal, if we're talking about zoonotic transmission, an animal has to come in contact with the human. And then a pathogen has to move from that animal to that human. And then with level two here, you, the pathogen has to actually be able to infect the human. Okay? So this involves receptors and biology. <laughs> okay? Now, not only that, let's use viruses because I like viruses. I'm a big fan of RNA viruses. And they, so you've got infection. So this virus moves into a host cell, a human host cell. It's never been there before. It needs to be able to replicate in that cell, and it needs to be able to get out. Okay? So there's another level here that a pathogen has to overcome. And then finally, they have to do this so efficiently that they are able, they, I'm talking about viruses, they, <laughs> these little guys, these intracellular organisms, are, have to be able to spread from human to human very efficiently. Okay, that's a lot to ask of one little organism. So a lot of what we've focused on in this whole idea of global health security is on these things. It's on the animal interface. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's where my area focuses, that's where Andrew's area focus. It's really interesting, okay? And a lot of this is determined by biological processes, and it's also by factors of biodiversity and how we interact with ecosystems as humans. But I think that you'd all agree, hopefully by now, that it's more complicated than that, okay? So when we get to this level, we're talking about human drivers now. We're talking about inadequate health systems that can control them. We're talking about poverty and we're talking about inequality. And yes, there are some biological processes as well. Okay? So, how do we make the world a safer place for everyone? Um, I'm hearing this a lot in the Zika response. Um, and I think it's an as an inner reaction to the Ebola response, right? There are a lot of government agencies, there are a lot of non-governmental agencies. There's a lot of people who kind of feel a little bad about what happened with Ebola. So they're adopting what they're calling a no-regrets response. Okay, this is a no-regrets policy. It's better to err on the side of over-resourcing. Um, the critical functions rather than risk failure by under-resourcing. Okay? So it's going to be okay if we throw everything at Zika right now. Because it's better than going over the just failing to act sufficiently early on. Okay? 
Okay, so this is my, I am a public health researcher, so this is my pitch. I don't know how many of you know who Brandon Dangerfield is, and maybe I'm aging myself right now. Um, Ronald Dangerfield gets no respect, right? He's a comedian, he's funny, but I would argue that public health is the Rodney Dangerfield of the health field. And the main reason why is because when public health works, no one notices. Okay? When public health works, everyone's healthy and everyone's happy, and they stop doing things like vector control and mosquitoes, right? They stop doing things like clean water systems, and all of these things that, you know, WH, or sorry, uh, public health, they, they really kind of, uh, they're, they don't get respect, okay? So what I'm kind of wondering with Zika here, when they're man mounting this strong, robust response, I'm wondering if the pendulum is going to swing the other way with this no regrets, regrets policy. They're going to dump a huge amount of money into Zika. By the way, does anyone know there's a yellow fever outbreak in South Saharan Africa right now? Spread by the same vector, Aedes aegypti. It's bad. Yellow fever kills a lot more people. Okay, my concern now is that Zika, people are going to put a lot of money into Zika response. I'm not saying or judging other than maybe can you not take Ebola money um, to put into Zika. My concern here is that there's going to be this robust response and there's going to be a backlash. Because if public health works, people are not going to get sick. Right? So, back to my question. How many of you think the U.S. was prepared for the Ebola outbreak? Anyone change their mind yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no sense I can tell. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I did think we were prepared, especially compared to other countries. But. Right. So here's my argument for why I think that we were. This is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a blood-borne pathogen very similar in transmission to Ebola. We, um, and healthcare workers, that are at increased risk of hepatitis B. Guess what, we have numbers. The CDC monitors hepatitis B in the US. And we actually notice when people get sick with hepatitis B. Not only that, guess what? And we put things in place. Is anyone here a healthcare worker? How many of you are vaccinated for hepatitis B? Raise your hand. How many of you received training on how to prevent hepatitis B transmission in clinics? How many of you have been trained in universal precautions? <coughs> All right. Pat yourself on back, your back and thank whoever you want, of, <laughs> whoever of your choosing, that you are doing healthcare in the U.S. Okay. Here's hepatitis C. Guess what? We have numbers for hepatitis C, too. Hepatitis C is another bloodborne pathogen. HIV is another bloodborne pathogen. We pay attention to this here. We have things that monitor it. When people get sick with this, we have response. This is hepatitis C and B incidents in Sierra Leone. We have no idea. So why do you think there was an Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone? And in Dallas, we had secondary transmission. So, my argument is, we were ready. We were absolutely ready. If we control epidemic, if we control endemic disease, we will mitigate the risks of epidemics. Okay? Think about Ebola in Dallas. So, pathogens have a limited amount of ways to actually get into humans. <laughs> and it's very common. It's just a few ways. Okay? So when you are investing in prevention and control of endemic diseases, you are reducing, you are ensuring that you are going to be reducing morbidity and mortality of those endemic diseases. You are going to have a more productive and healthy society. You're going to have people who have faith in the health system. And you are going to be able to prevent spillover from becoming an epidemic. 
And that, to me, is no regrets response. So, let's see. Oh, that's a similar slide. I'm sorry, I did this really late one night. <laughs> so, how do we do this, right? It's, it's really nice and very, and I am a public health researcher that doesn't do policy. I love policy people, they're special people. <laughs> they're not mine, they're, they're not me. I, I love to produce data. And if really special policy people want to move that into a realm where my brain does not understand and function, nor um, am able to deal with very difficult decisions um, about who gets funding and who doesn't and where we prioritize things, um, I'm really happy if you can use my evidence. I'm really happy when evidence informs policy. Okay? Which is something that I think that we've really forgotten about in the US. Anyway, how about flexible funding? Okay? So I think we need to start thinking about funding horizontally, not just vertically. Vertically means developing a vaccine, developing a vaccine for Ebola, developing a vaccine for Zika. Guess what we're going to take care of if we do that? We're going to take care of Zika. We're going to take care of Ebola. What about hepatitis B? But if we start to fund hepatitis B interventions with Ebola funding, it's a win-win situation, right? I mean, that's my thinking. That is value for money. That is efficient use of my taxpayer dollar. Okay? We need to think about modes of transmission, and we need to target vulnerable at-risk populations <coughs> that get infectious diseases all the time. And we need to make sure that the funding we have is flexible enough that we can address these. If, you know, it's not a bleeding heart liberal excuse that we're talking about here. It's common sense. This is infectious <coughs> disease. Okay? Everyone's at risk. So if you control in at-risk populations, you're going to be safer. So, yeah. I'd really love to get some funding for hepatitis B and Ebola. Okay. So I think that if we target existing health problems, and we can evaluate and measure them, and monitor them, we are going to have a good idea about a health system's ability to withstand uh, an epidemic threat. <coughs> okay? So if you went into a country and you said, is this country prepared to deal with Ebola? Guess what you could do? You can look at hepatitis B and determine if they are or aren't. Okay? The other thing we need to do is really build some resilient communities. This is something that um, is one of the reasons why I'm so amazed by the Ebola Survivor Corps, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. I think it's, it's a real bottom-up approach to health systems building, and this, is, this doesn't happen very often. Um, and I don't blame NGOs and governmental organizations who have funders that, have, that give them 12 to 18 months. I'm thinking funders here. Well, I've seen you kind of here. Um, but they have 12 to 18 months to implement a program. They're not going to stop and for three months talk to the communities about how they think it's the best way to, to implement it. So I think that we need to start looking at, at how we can start doing something from the community level and how the communities can inform how we need to do program implementation rather than us finding culturally relevant ways to tell them how to do stuff. Okay? So we also need community integration into surveillance. Um, so right now in Sierra Leone, there are two surveillance officers. I think they've gotten down to the chiefdom level. Chiefdom's kind of big still, right? So these people are responsible for running around the chiefdom, making sure that people, there's nothing funny going on. How about if we train communities to be able to detect when something's not right. We don't need to have them identify that it's Ebola. We don't need to have them identify that it's yellow fever. They will know when something's not right. If a healthcare worker dies, if two people within the same house die within a week, these are things that communities can actually communicate to the surveillance systems if they are empowered to do so. And trust me, they want to do it. Okay? 
We also need to integrate a lot of different ways and move away from um, mandating a biomedical approach to solving a lot of these problems and integrating traditional healers and different ways of answering questions and different explanations for why people get sick. <coughs> so, the other thing. I think that we need to, if you're interested in public health, we really need to rebrand ourselves because of the Rodney Dangerfield effect. Okay? When we do our jobs, no one knows us. Remember 9-11? It's the same concept. Security and health security are the same things, right? So we've built this whole new branch of government, the Division of Homeland Security, and they go out and they do stuff. And when they do stuff effectively, bombs don't go off and terrorists don't do stuff. And I have to take my shoes off at the airport. So these are all things that we get to do. And because they because they branded themselves in fancy ways and have fancy uniforms. I, I really think that we need to do this for public health. Now, I think it's cool. And I, 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 I wouldn't mind wearing a uniform, but I have to think about what I have to wear this one. So, here's the deal though. This is a militarization or a securitization, I, just, I think I just made that up, of public health, okay? So there are some risks involved in this. There are risks in overemphasizing risk in public health. Okay, and this is a good example here. We're worried about refugees in the Department of Homeland Security. Even if they're not, they think it's so important to the American public that they put it on their website. So we are creating an other with this. Right? Refugees are the others. We really need to be careful if we want to try this. Try to really hype up public health to make sure that we're not creating another. In the Ebola outbreak, if you were African and you tried to get into the US, even if you were from Swaziland, good luck. You got some problems. Okay, so that is something that we need to be cognizant of. And I think that that starts from a level of whether we decide as a society whether we start to care about people dying in Africa as much as they start, they, we care about people dying here. Or in Europe. And I think we need to figure out if we really, if that's really important to us as a society. And I certainly hope it is. Alright, so <coughs> conclusion. No regrets. Okay. Emerging diseases might start off as spillover from animals, okay, um, into humans. But what makes them epidemics is really human-driven activities and factors. Um, and I think that we need to start to understand that dysfunctional health systems, even in the most remote areas, are threats to us all. Whether that be that it's a threat to me personally, or it's a threat to someone that I care about in a completely different country because we decide as a society that we're going to do that. We're going to care about that. Okay. The last thing is when you control for endemic diseases, you do get to control and mitigate the risks of epidemic diseases. I'm not going to say that you'll reduce and eliminate all epidemics. But I think that we're, we look at Dallas and we look at Freetown, I think we can see the difference. Okay. Yeah. I haven't, um, I've given a lot of talks in Ebola. And I haven't shown this slide to anyone, so thank you all for creating a venue where I can do this. These are all my friends in Canada. And they're the true heroes here. They're the ones that didn't get to go home. Because they were home. They were in Ebola land. 
them. When we think about the heroism that occurred in Sierra Leone and Guinea and Liberia, I really hope we don't forget that 90% of the work, 100% of the family loss, and nearly 100% of the fatalities occurred to people like this. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, um, I was going to ask about your question about whether or not the U.S. was prepared for the Ebola outbreak. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, during the time leading up to that, uh, when it had uh, broken out in Africa, I believe all the officials, the relevant officials in the health structure, always saying, essentially, it can't happen here. Not, not explaining why that was, but just that it was an immutable natural law that it just can't uh, happen here. And I think that was the main preparedness that was taken by the authorities in this country, was just to rely on this um, mytho mythological idea that it just can't happen here for whatever reason. And then when it did happen here, they were just taken totally uh, unawares. Um, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I got quarantined every single time I came back. I've been quarantined under house quarantine so much, I was sick of my house. Um, I got quarantined so much that I would be stuck in my house before I could actually go back. I never even got to move around in New Orleans. So I was, I was up there for a day quarantine, and then I'd go back to Sierra Leone. So I was, I, Mark, Emily, we all got to go through the airport screening. My favorite was at the O'Hare Airport, where I got off the plane and they made me wear a mask. What airport? O'Hare. It's the only airport. I went through a lot of airports. O'Hare was the only airport that made me wear a mask, despite the fact that there's no aerosol transmission in Ebola. Okay. <laughs> so I got off the plane. It's the first time I've ever felt stigmatized by being an Ebola responder. I got off the plane, there was um, a custom thing with there to hand me a mask. And then I got to walk through all of the people that I had just been on a plane with for, for seven hours. <laughs> um, and got to see them look at me in horror. And I got to sit in a room where people in full PPE, even though I'm not having any symptoms whatsoever, and Ebola is not transmitted, less likely to be transmitted, if you're not sick. Um, I got to sit in the room where they got to question me for a long period of time. And they actually got better at this, but initially it's, it really sucked. And it, I was educating the people that were interviewing me on how to do things properly. Um, in September last year, even though Sierra Leone had, had, hadn't had a case, and I was not doing anything related to people look. Um, I did get malaria. Make sure you take your prophylaxis. Um, I got malaria. I went to the health to the emergency room and they really did freak out at that point. I won't say they did it properly or responded properly um, at this emergency room that I will not name uh, in New Orleans that I work at. <laughs> But uh, they did respond, and they did do a lot of things right. Um, so, so I, I don't know how much the public understands how much response was actually. There were hospitals that were totally gearing up. They were really preparing for us. They were doing drills. They wanted me at Tulane to be a secret shopper, right? 
to come in and say, you know, I'm not feeling so good. Just got back from West Africa. And they wanted me to see what would happen. Um, and then I got to live the dream and, and do it for real. So I, I do think that there was some, I think that, yeah. I think that on that end of things, I do think that they were prepared. And once again, I think sometimes public health response um, goes into the or unrecognized. Lena, um, you, what do you think is the status of the recovery of the healthcare system in Sierra Leone as of today? As of t well, if you'd asked me this 12 months ago, I would have been really, really excited. Because there were a lot of promises made about, and a lot of commitments made about how they were going to really rebuild these countries and the health systems there. And what I'm seeing now is that there's, <coughs> there's distractions. Um, and there's, and they're, they've moved on to a lot of other things. And I actually thought, it, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't realize that it was going to happen so quickly. Um, you know, and this is policy. This is people who have limited amounts of money, vast, limited amounts of money. They have to make decisions about where they're going to put it. I love it when they base those decisions on evidence. Um, and I'd love to see that happen. <coughs> First, I, I want to thank you for that last slide. It really helped me to understand more deeply the talk. Um, my question is about the, um, in the middle where you talked about the, um, why uh, this outbreak was so much worse than the others, but um, you didn't really, I don't think you gave a really full response to that because um, uh, many of the cases were, were uh, in Sierra, many of the other uh, outbreaks were in other this, places with the same sorts of conditions. Yeah. Um similar conditions. Once again, the roads. I really, it's, it's really strange that something like roads and transportation and movement um, can have so much of an effect. And, but in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, there's, there's huge movement of population. People go from one end of the country to the other um, every day sometimes. And when do you have something else to add to that? Everyone, uh, I would just like to add yeah, that I think the international component, crossing international yeah. borders, and the um, lack of cooperation between between the two countries, yeah, the language barrier, and the initial denial <coughs> or the resistance to accept that Ebola had crossed into the other countries, um, definitely contributed. If you look at the other countries, like for example, the DRC, um, Congo, or Uganda, they've had multiple. Uh, Ebola outbreaks for many, many years, and they actually have uh, national teams within the countries that are very used to this and able to respond really quickly um, and communicate really well with the local populations that are there as well. So, um, and actually a lot of Congolese and Ugandans came to Sierra Leone to assist with this outbreak as well. So I think there are a lot of different factors, but I think the movement was a huge um, the one thing that I'll add to that, it's Mark, I'm just adding a... Right now, this has less to do with um, why it happened, but when the containment began to happen, and that had to do more with, again, community mobilization and social mobilization and what you're talking about about the wrong messaging and the use of sort of trying to quarantine and blame it on Bushmeat and when things started to turn around it was when communities began to organize in particular around safe and respectful burials because that was one of the main vectors and one of the main drivers was the cultural belief that for a person to be buried properly, there had to be this very uh, hands-on community family burial process, and that led to transmission to entire communities. And it, it was when you had, at the grassroots level, I think it was mostly where, where, where we saw it first was in Liberia, where, where, where the communities were organizing to, uh, to say no, that, that <coughs> We have to find other ways of doing this respectfully. 
and to have the imams and the priests and the, and the paramount chiefs buy into that and community organizers buy into that and get that message out. And I think that that was one of the huge things. And that when there was this sort of top down, just we're going to stop this. And again, it's, it's, it's due to what you're eating. And you're, I mean, things totally were not in control. That, that just kept exploding. And, um, but I, I would argue that that's not unique to this outbreak. Right. This oh. is really, really, that's, that's Ebola. And there's a learning curve. And it's like Emily was saying, you've got communities that have their first introduction, you see that. You see a huge amount of resistance, <coughs> denial. And then in subsequent outbreaks, they, they got down. They know what they're doing. And Sorry, I was like, can I add one more thing? Sorry, I, I don't want to sound like this, but, um, you know, in the beginning, um, I was in Kailam District, uh, in Lino's Red Oval, um, on the border of Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, and I did meet a lot of resistance in July of 2014 when I arrived, um, when we were able to get um, community engagement and people were ready to have safe burials. Uh, the rainy season had just begun and there weren't enough ambulances and burial teams, so suddenly you had community engagement. We had a massive amount of community health workers working in their communities, and um, there, there wasn't enough uh, ambulances or burial teams, so you had sick people and you had bodies that weren't able to be buried, or sick people that weren't able to receive treatment. And so that was also a huge problem, is that there just wasn't enough, and so people were stuck there. And if you can imagine, as awful as it is, you have your family members dead in your yard. What do you do? It's raining, it's hot, it, and for multiple days, it's just, you have to do something. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of factors. So once you can convince people to buy into this response, then you demonstrate complete, utter dysfunction, um, which was the case. So I also want to echo people's thanks. Um, my question brings back, uh, in, a, in a slightly different way, I think the question of whether the United States was ready for Ebola. Um, and ties in with your question, or, or your suggestion about securitization or militarization of public health. Um, and so I guess my question is, do you think the United States was ready for Ebola in West Africa? No. And given that your answer is no, I wonder if you could reflect on the implications given what's happened with Homeland Security here and its coordination outside our borders and with anti-terrorist efforts outside our borders and coordination with other governments around the world. What the implications of a militarized or securitized public health might look like, not here, but in Sierra Leone, where I work in Zambia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and, and how that factors into the, the risk calculus. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your question. It's a great one, and I'm not sure entirely how to answer it, other than I think that, I'm not, sh I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but I think we're going to see it play out. Um, it's already happening, and I'm still trying to figure out if it's a bad thing. Um, just like I'm trying to figure out if Ted Cruz or Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't know yet. And so, so this is the thing. I, um, I'm not sure, but I do know that it's happening. I know that, that they're taking approaches to evaluating the readiness of, um, of countries, particularly developing countries, that have lagged behind in what's called the International Health Regulations of 2005. Um, which all the member states agreed that they would have this level of robust surveillance, control of borders, um, to try to prevent health issues from spilling over into neighboring areas or around the world. Um, and there's been this movement for a global health security agenda, and I, I'm kind of excited in some ways. They're doing these assessments about health systems and readiness um, in the context of whether or not these countries have capacity. What I hope that yields is then, after seeing a profound lack of this readiness, then people, well, not people, but governments and agencies um, act in terms of trying to build that up. So I don't know if it's good. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but it's happening. Hi, 
thanks for, for a great talk. Um, in the UK, one of the nurses who contracted the Ebola whilst volunteering had one or two relapses after she had supposedly been cured. I was just wondering whether this Ebola Survivor um, Core project, um, I was wondering how concerned you are about relapses of Ebola and survivors, and also how much that forms part of the surveillance and the education, not only as the communities, but also the healthcare workers who are looking after these patients in the future. I know you want to reduce stigma, right. but there is a risk at the same time, and how do you balance this? Right, so I think Ebola Survivor Core is definitely very cognizant of the sequela of, of Ebola and the, the long-term health effects of the infection. Um, the, the case of um, the, the UK nurse, uh, it, and that risk of seeing that happen in Sierra Leone survivors, for example, um, we're not seeing it. Um, and I'm not sure, other than sexual transmission from Ebola survivors, um, but also, and then one case in Liberia where it's questionable if um, a mother who, a survivor who then got pregnant during her pregnancy was immunosuppressed and then the virus, her son got sick shortly after her giving birth. And so and that's basically the only link. But um, we're not seeing that. Um, and in general, um, this recrudescence of Ebola in the general population. Definitely Ebola survivor core is ready to respond to it. And the, the survivors that work for the organization um, are aware of it and are looking for it. But the thing that I think is um, when you have <coughs> crazy experimental therapeutics, they're at someone who has a sickness. Um, I don't know if what we're seeing is a result of that. Because everything was implemented without controls and under conditions that were not controlled. And I don't know if maybe eliminating a, a, the viral replication um, or if the monoclonal antibodies interfered with some kind of effective um, immune response at that point. So um, rather, sorry, to pitch my love of randomized control trials. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, we don't know. Um, the other, there's a doctor, an American doctor, Ian Crozier, who also had um, sustained people with infection. I don't know if you guys remember, his eyes changed color and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and he had he was the sickest Ebola patient I think that's ever survived. And he had everything thrown at him. Um, so, we don't know. We have time for about two questions. We'll take one from this side and one from that side, and then we'll continue the <coughs> conversation at all first. So, can we start on this side? Thank you so much for your presentation. And I first of all want to thank you for emphasizing the concentrating more on horizontal versus vertical uh, prevention and putting out of money into specific uh, healthcare problem without looking at the entire healthcare system. And that's the basis of my question. I come from Uganda and I, I saw the HIV epidemic growing up as a child and I saw the Ebola outbreak in 2000. I was a medical student in Uganda. And um, one thing I, I noticed is that from the international response, there was a lot of training for Ugandans <coughs> themselves, not, not just from the US actually, but also from Europe and many other countries responded by training many people. And right now, there's actually a saturation of epidemiologists. Yes, they came over. Yes, people then to get from Uganda. And so, so right now, when you actually go to work in Uganda, you have collaborators rather than hard experts coming exactly. from John Hopkins or UW Madison to go and implement things in Uganda. So my question is, in West Africa, is there a long-term plan for that kind of thing? And I guess, I don't know whether this is the scope of, um, whether you're the right person to ask this question, but I'm wondering whether there's a long-term plan about your training individuals on ground 
to actually be able to do the response themselves without looking to the vocab experts coming from the US and Europe. Thank you. I think it's a great question, and it's actually it's critical. Um, right now in Sierra Leone, there are hundreds and hundreds of healthcare workers that know how to do proper infection prevention and control because they've gone through um, working in Ebola treatment centers. Um, there's a huge amount of local capacity, and if they don't harness it right now and keep retraining them, and also make sure that the, this knowledge transfers to lots of other areas, then I, then I think it's really going to be an even bigger tragedy. Um, so one of the things that I've tried to do personally um, is <coughs> I'm now working with the university in Sierra Leone rather than just trapping rats. I'm, um, I'm trying. I'm adjunct faculty at Jolly University in their uh, School of Community Health Sciences. So one of the main things that I want to try to do, if we can get funding, is is to is to make sure that this um, IPC training is integrated into the nursing, the community health officers, and all of the curriculum at that university, which um, trains a huge amount of workers. And that will be local people who already have the knowledge. Maybe um, and WHO um, is interested in reseeding and retraining the trainers. Um, and I actually think training of trainers is a really horrible model unless you're dealing with making sure that those trainers actually train um, and ensuring that happens. But I think this will work. Um, so in terms of the, the political will for this to happen, I, I think everyone wants it. In Sierra Leone, they, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a they call it integrated disease surveillance and response that was supposed to be um, implemented all over Sub-Saharan Africa. And it wasn't in place and it wasn't functioning in Sierra Leone. And they just deployed and retrained surveillance officers, chief to level things. So, so there, there definitely is, in the formal, traditional um, sectors, some of this going on. But I also think that it needs to happen at the community level, too. So the communities are also educated at this point. right? So we need to make sure that the communities remember um, what they did. That was effective in Ebola response. And it's one of the aims of Ebola Survivor Corps. Um, and so I can't really give you specifics on this um, other than everyone's aware of it. Um, and oftentimes it's it's funny. I mean, it really is. It's it's funny. So. <coughs> I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank you also for your presentation and for the work that you did um, and continue to do. My question is somewhat similar to the previous question, perhaps piggybacking off of that, and it's about the community surveillance. I was in West Africa in 2014, not in one of the countries um, that was directly impacted. I'm not quite sure if I can say that because I think all of us were impacted by Ebola. Um, people were afraid. I was there in August of 2014, so people were afraid I was in the Gambia. And I was working with an organization that works with adolescent girls, and the girls actually did um, educated themselves after I left and did an Ebola sensitization campaign where they traveled throughout the country educating people. So my question about community surveillance is that when there's no perceived threat, how do you do community surveillance? Because people aren't really seeing that as a priority when there's no perceived threat. Um, I continue to work with this organization, so I, I really would like some advice from you on how we can continue to do that. I think that there's uh, a big movement to try to integrate informal uh, surveillance systems and surveillance monitoring um, into traditional surveillance systems right now. So Health Map, you guys know about Health Map? They um, check them out at healthmap.org. Um, they do kind of a outbreak responding, but what they do is they, they scan social media to look for reports. 
So this kind of stuff is, is, is popping up. And I think that if we can tap into a lot of the social media that happens in West Africa, that's a potential right there. Um, but community event-based surveillance is something that I'm really excited about. Um, and it's, and it's, and, um, it's still kind of growing and we're, we're figuring out how to do this and implement this properly, but basically I think it moves or takes surveillance um, just a step back in terms of depending on the laboratory-based um, confirmation of something um, before a community, before there's any kind of response, right? So like I said, you know, if, if, if a healthcare worker dies, in a village, you know, if two people die, if any mom dies in the village, um, if two people die in the same week of similar symptoms, all these things are things that we need to um, to be engaging communities and being concerned about. And it happens. And I mean, the threat of Ebola may um, wane, but there's a lot of other stuff. And I think that the only way that we can make sure that communities continue to be engaged is if we have good response to their cries for, you know, something's not right in the community, we need to be able to make sure that we integrate into the traditional informal surveillance system so when a community event occurs, there's a proper response. And I think you'll see that perpetuation. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in zoonotic diseases, the other thing that I think um, is also important is looking at animal health as well. In Sierra Leone, they're really good at quarantining their goats when they have PPR. And they, they know they have concepts of quarantine and isolation. Um, and so I think that when we start to um, integrate some of this response so people can practice um, on a regular basis, either humans or animals, um, I think that we'll, we'll be reinforcing these things. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I just want to add, add one piece to that is that there's the ongoing surveillance for disease, but one of the things that the Ebola Survivor Corps is talking about doing is integrating, say, the work of like the Hesperian Foundation, which looks like where there is no doctor that look at community health organizing that addresses like what do you see in front of you? And if what you see is malnutrition and what you see is lack of potable water, and what you see is uh, people getting sick because there's not a separation, say, between sewage and water. And you begin to engage communities through health, kind of the health promoter model. And you, this is where we see ourselves going, so that, that vigilance around looking for disease is rolled into a broader sense of becoming sort of advocates for health. And, that, I think, is something that will always be an ongoing thing and therefore relevant. And I don't know if that sort of, to me, that changes the entire equation. It's just not waiting for somebody to die of something dramatic, but it's how do we actually actively and proactively sort of engage in making healthier communities. And at the same time, we are vigilant for these more dramatic diseases. But one of the things, again, that makes people so vulnerable is malnutrition. I mean, that's one of the first things that we had to deal with kids, was realizing that these kids had Ebola, but that they were dramatically malnourished. And so we had to address that, too. So, I mean, it, it's, I think, at least what, like, this moves me into the place where Sarah and I were going to talk about, hey, support and become involved with the Ebola Survival Club. Because we're just starting. We are a brand new organization that really has just focused with this first sense of how do we hire and train and empower this group of survivors. And we, we focus really on just achieving that end in Konadungu, and we've succeeded. But now we want to expand our vision, it also include more people in it. I encourage you to sign up. So where do we have, uh, like, can people sign up, like, email or something, right? Table, is that right? <laughs> so please, I mean, part of it is that you can be part of the process of building this. We, we are a, a relatively small group of people 
you know, in Seattle and in Tulane and Madison, uh, in West Africa, and we're excited about sort of expanding that, and you can be part of that. So please give us, you know, uh, your email, your information, talk to us, come over and join us at Oliver's. But uh, know that this is something that we believe strongly is a very powerful model that is relevant not just in West Africa and not just with Ebola, but as uh, a way of sort of uh, expanding the whole concept of health and healthy communities. Sorry, yeah. So just I would really, really like to give Lena a big round of applause. And like